once again and warm welcome to everyone out there listening to me. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon based on the time zone that you're joining in. Uh, my name is Siddhant, you can call me Sid. I work with Neo4j as the developer relations lead for APAC, where I help build developer communities. So just a quick introduction about myself, what, what I do, uh, or rather more in terms of what how my journey has been. Uh, I am born and brought up in uh, Delhi uh, for for the last eight years. I, I'm in Bangalore. I started my journey with IBM, then I went on to work with Google, uh, 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 two startups in between as well, and then now with Neo4j, bringing in almost a decade of experience in community building. That's what I've been doing for my entire of my life. Uh, by the way, that's the QR code that you're seeing on your screen uh, or for my Twitter handle if you wish to get connected with me in future. Okay, <clears throat> one more thing which I would love to call out is some of the communities and the programs that have been very integral part of my life. Uh, this is one slide that I always love to keep in my deck uh, and acknowledge the efforts um, that these programs have put in to build and shape my uh, career, my professional life, my personal life and everything. Uh, Google Student Ambassador Program, GDG New Delhi, Head Start, Intel Software Innovator Program, Atari Innovation Mission, GDG Cloud New Delhi, ACM, uh, GFSA, and most recently the GDG Cloud Bangalore community. So I've been associated with these communities. Some of them I've left, some of them I've still continued doing it, uh, but I'm still connected one way or the other with these communities and this network. Uh, very, very excited to talk to you about this interesting topic called graphs are everywhere. There are a lot of things that I'm going to cover today. Uh, in this entire session, and this is just a brief on what we're going to cover today. So we're going to talk about what are graphs and why they are amazing. Uh, how to spot a graph-shaped problem. We're going to touch a little bit on the Neo4j, the property graph model, and introduction to Cypher. Uh, we'll see if we have luxury of time. We'll try to do a demo as well on a movie graph. Uh, we'll try to build a movie graph with an existing uh, movie graph database, a data set. Uh, and then towards the end, I'm going to talk about a couple of CTAs for you to take back on how to continue your graph journey with Neo4j. Um, I'm sure you all are excited for this session. So let's bring on to the show and move on to the part uh, about what is a graph. I'm sure I've been, so I'm going to talk about graphs the entire session. Uh, and there will be a fundamental question if you have not heard of graphs or might have heard of graphs in your life would be this, like, is it the thing on the left or is it the thing on the right, right? Any guesses, you can maybe use the chat window to push in your the thoughts. Is, what is it? Is it the left or is it the right? I can see the chat window. Okay, both, left, right, both. Interesting, either, both. Okay, that's great. Thank you, thanks so much. So, Actually, what we call a graph is a thing on the left. It's a network of connected entities or connected nodes. On the right side, especially in the US or like in our elementary days or in our K-12s, you oftentimes see that people call the right or the thing on the right as a graph. Uh, well, we prefer to say it like a diagram or a chart to make the clear distinction. So for us, a graph and a network are what we are talking about versus the diagrams and the charts. So the thing on the left is what we're gonna focus upon versus the thing on the right. Okay, now, well, you must be wondering that the graphs are fairly new and talking about a really new, exciting technology. Well, yes and no at the same time. Uh, this this theory, graph theory is not something new. It, it goes back to 300 years, back 300 years old, when this guy, Leonard Euler, went on to work on something called as graph theory and considered the father of graphs. Okay, so in term, simpler terms, a graph is a collection of objects, each of which has a set of binary links with the other objects. So graphs are a useful way to model data for the purpose of mathematical analysis. And they've been used around for quite a long time. It's just that they've been used, the graph theory has been used as a graph database, like the laid the foundations of graph database, and that's what I'm gonna I'm gonna cover up in a while. So the first use of graphs was by Leonard Euler, as I said, in 1735, uh, when he used graph theory to prove that the famous seven bridges of Konigsberg problem had no solution. If you're curious, we can talk about the seven bridges problem and Euler's proof. Uh, but yeah, just just to give you a brief uh, on seven bridges problem, that 
uh, as part of the problem, uh, Konigsberg was asked, sorry, uh, Leonard Euler was asked that, can, is there a possible route through the city that crosses every bridge exactly one? So there are seven bridges uh, that you can see over here uh, that are spanning the Pregel River. It includes two large islands which are connected to one another and, the, uh, and, the, and to the river banks by seven bridges. So map of this arrangement is what you're seeing on the left-hand side um, on the screen. And it was asked by uh, Leonard Euler, uh, asked to the Leonard Euler by the mayor of Konigsberg, Prussia, which is now called as uh, Kalingard, Russia. That is there a possible route that you can through the city that you can cross every bridge exactly once? Uh, so some pen and paper experimentation will quickly suggest that there is no such route. However, proving that there is no such solution is much more difficult. So Euler invented graph theory as a tool to aid this proof. The graph representation of the problem is what I'm going to talk about in my next slide. So there are four land masses, each represented by a node and seven bridges, um, each represented by a relationship. Okay. So all in all, uh, you have been using graphs. It's just that you have not realized that you have been using graphs. So everything you can connect that you can connect is a graph. Uh, and there's, basically, there's no such thing as disconnected pieces of information in this world, right? So there are people who have connections, historical events, which kind of have reasons why they have happened, uh, but they also have outcomes. There are things like markets, economic markets, especially today, we, we see that a lot, that there are so many dependencies on markets. If someone cuts someone else off a market, then we have a lot of problems, right? And not just directly, but transitively. So not just the organization that cuts off from the market, but also the dependents. Uh, the things like network dependencies and software, for instance, what about my libraries and libraries, libraries and transitive dependencies? What about the security there, right? So what happens if one of these libraries that I'm not directly depending on, but I'm depending on like three steps removed has a security issue. And I'm still affected by that because I transitively use this library. So there's a lot of things. So for instance, what is a very simple molecule? But you, of course, know proteins and DNA and all kinds of organic molecules are complex networks. In short, whenever you can basically draw something on a whiteboard with arrows and circles, that can be represented as a graph. So I think graphs are everywhere. A very, very simple example. Uh, consider this as an example of the metro network in your area. Uh, London has a very vast underground or metro network, the rail network. This is something which I'm taken taking from Delhi. I'm like a like a Delhiite, so it's taken reference from Delhi over here. Uh, what you see on this this particular map is how you connected, like how the almost the entire of Delhi is connected uh, via the Delhi metro. Now, if I have to go from um, let's say the Delhi airport to my home, which is somewhere in the red line that you're seeing uh, pass passing through. Let me see if I can pull in the laser pointer. Yeah, so we have our airport somewhere here. I'm not sure if my laser pointer is visible, just I'm guessing. So my airport is here and I need to get to my home, which is somewhere here. So there could be multiple routes that I can take, which is the shortest route, which is where I can maybe visit a friend of mine or which is a common distance to a friend of mine who stays maybe somewhere on this line and green line on the over here or maybe somewhere here from the blue line. So we both can come to a, to a common point and meet uh, somewhere maybe over here. So these are, these are some of the like very trivial problems that you are trying to solve on a day-to-day -day life. Now multiply 10x, that's what graphs is. Uh, more about it in a while. So graphs are essentially everywhere. Okay, enough of graphs basics. I'm gonna move into what graph databases are and how the Neo4j started. So I'm right now in Bangalore in India, the Silicon Valley of India. But let me tell you a story about a place on the other side of the planet called Lund. It's a city in Sweden and houses one of the world's oldest universities. Uh, born there was Emil Ephraim, our CEO, CEO of Neo4j. Uh, now, he was working very closely with IIT Bombay. And uh, while on a flight to Mumbai, he sketched the fundamental idea of Neo4j on just a piece of paper. So he sketched out a data model that he hoped would make some sense, some kind of sense, uh, one that will get away with all the fancy stuff from relational databases and allowed them to just deal with domain level details. 
the original napkin has been lost to time, but uh, thanks to our design team who made a copy from memory. So let's take a closer look at this a closer look a, a closer look at this napkin. It predicts what we today know as a property graph model. The property graph model is very simple. It builds on three concepts. You have nodes, you have type relationships between them, and you have key value pairs that we call properties on both nodes and relationships. There's nothing fancy over here. No algebra, no predicate logic, no set theory. Okay, so the true power of property graph model is that it's natural human way approach data. Uh, the Neo4j graph model allows you to model data in a way that everyone can understand. This ultimately makes the data more useful because it's easily understood without any cognitive dissonance. Uh, with the graph data, a graph model that you're seeing over here, there's no need to translate data into a traditional data model with rows or the columns that you've been seeing in your relational databases, which can be difficult for the businesses to extract uh, understanding from. Um, instead, the graph model um, can can be very intuitive and eager to digest, making it easier to communicate across the business functions. So graph model allows uh, for more exploration of data and understanding the context around it, which helps to expand curiosity and identify new insights. The graph model maps the real world as is, just like what you draw on a whiteboard and it's completely flexible, allowing you to adapt as your needs change. Um, now, overall, graph model makes it easier to understand and use data, leading to more insights and better decision making that you're seeing over here. And that's how the graph databases came into picture, uh, where earlier uh, we, we used to like solely work on relational databases, then came in concept of NoSQL databases, then came in the concept of graph databases, right? Okay, so we've been talking about graphs the property graph model, what are graphs, but why graphs? Like you must be wondering why we should really use graphs. Well, industries have been functioning using relational databases from a long, long, long time ago, uh, like from long time. Then why there is a need for us specifically for a graph database? Well, most business challenges facing the enterprise today are in fact data challenges. Now, why do I say that? Because data is at the core of all modern businesses. In today's world, organizations generate and collect vast amounts of data from various sources, including your customers, your suppliers, your employees, um, your operational systems. Now, this data can be used to gain deeper understanding of aspects of the business, such as your like customer behavior, your market trends, your operational efficiency. But we all know it is increasingly complex, painstaking and slow to manage and understand that data is created and stored within enterprise applications and systems, right? So let's take an example of this organization called Caterpillar. Uh, I'm not sure if you have heard of this. This is the world's largest manufacturer of heavy equipment and machinery. So Caterpillar realized that they were sitting on a gold mine of data, but it was hidden across a mountain of disparate maintenance and repair documents or records. So they needed to find a way to unlock valuable insights hidden within vast repository of technical documents that they were working on. And they want to understand patterns and relationships. So in order to make equipment repair and maintenance more efficient and improve the supply chain processes, they thought of like, why not? Let's find some valuable insights from our data that's sitting out there. Now, this is not a challenge that is unique to Caterpillar. At the heart of every enterprise challenge today is an explosion of data complexity. And this is across all industries. With the increasing amount of digitization in the economy, all companies are data companies. They're generating, they're collecting, they're processing vast amounts of data, um, often from a variety of sources as well, such as your SaaS apps, your social media, your IoT devices, your online transactions. So whether it's, it's, it's Hazens, who is, uh, if you've heard of it, uh, it's a Swedish company. Uh, they're the leading manufacturers, I think, in mattresses and beds. Uh, so they are pursuing a full 360 degree view of its cus customers uh, while improving sales operations, managing 275 points of sale over 200,000 different combinations of components and colors, or PwC, which I'm sure everybody would have heard of, which is tackling the growing threat of digital fraud 
and money laundering disguised in complex networks of financial transactions. Or Adobe was managing and growing the world's largest creative network for showcasing and discovering uh, creative art. These are all data problems. And it's not just that data volumes are growing exponentially. Data is increasingly complex and connected. The first number of slide, uh, number on the slide is almost unfathomable. Uh, unfathomable. Uh, it's predicted we'll, oh, we'll have over 200 zettabytes in cloud storage by 2025. So one zettabyte is a billion terabytes, um, if that helps, but if not helpful. So I asked ChatGPT, and this is what it told me. To put into perspective, it would take approximately 250 billion DVDs to store a zettabyte of data, or it would take over 4.4 million years to watch all the videos contained within a zettabyte, one zettabyte. And we're talking about 200 zettabytes over here. But the second number that you're seeing over there uh, is actually more interesting. So according to Okta's 2023 uh, Business at Work report, the average European company now has 65 apps SaaS apps deployed. This is across marketing, sales, uh, finance, HR, customer success, customer service, etc. All producing valuable business data to guide business decisions, improve operations, and delivering better customer experiences. Oh, in case you're curious, the average volume of apps in North America is 98. But it's not just people and apps that are creating data. Everyone is connected to everything. In 2025, we are projected to have 41 billion, yes, I'm talking about 41 billion IoT connected devices. So organizations are drowning in data, but we frequently hear from leaders that all the data is not delivering on the promise of deeper understanding of insights. So what happens if you don't use a graph database? Organizations often have multiple systems and applications which have a tendency to create data silos that are not integrated with one another. This leads to data duplication, inconsistencies, and gaps that makes it difficult to gain a complete view of the business. And top of that, uh, true business value is often only realized when data from multiple sources are integrated to provide a broader, fuller view. Okay. So growth of data that is inherently connected continues to rise. We know this for a fact. And increasingly, the business value is hidden in the structures and relationships of those data connections. It is the connections and the insights derived from seeing the points of intersection that are the most part. So it is these relationships that, that I'm talking about over here that unlock opportunities and open the doors to innovation and competitive advantages you didn't know existed. And that's the reality for enterprises today, that it's increasingly complex, painstaking, slow and expensive to extract actionable insights from these interconnected data sets. Business value is hidden, not just in data points, but more so in relationships and patterns across billions of data connections. Well, yeah, of course, there are uh, traditional approaches to data management, but I'm pretty sure they can't solve this problem for us. The relational databases struggle with the complexity and scale uh, of these interconnected data sets. It's not unsurprising when you think about the relational database was originally architected for sort of efficiency, not surfacing data patterns and relationships. Now these systems are breaking down because the relationships in the data are becoming too complex. If you look at the relation databases, they aren't well adapted to interconnected and semi-structured data. Uh, connections in data can uh, contain context and meaning but traditional databases report connection. So relationship queries require painful SQL and lots of lookups and joins. The schema rigidity makes it difficult to update the data model and limits query uh, quick expansion to new, use, new users. Um, other NoSQL databases are built to scale, simple uh, data storage and ret uh, retrieval, and lack of guaranteed data validity, the asset, is a major issue with business critical applications. So there's a fundamentally new approach that is needed out here to solve this problem. You must approach the technology in a fundamentally different way. Doing more of the same is the wrong answer. You've got to expand your thinking about data. And it's not just about the data points themselves, but about the connections between them. And the solution is graphs. Graph databases are designed to manage and uncover hidden patterns and connections 
common in today's highly connected data. They think in relationships, just like the human brain, and they're built for today's fast moving world in which data sets are in constant motion. Well, okay. You might feel uh, the data, uh, we are talking about graphs, we are talking about complex data. So there's a lot of network, it's gonna be tough. It might look difficult or hard at the starting, but trust me, when you start working on it, you'll fall in love with it. So let me show you how. I'll just gonna introduce you to graph databases, how graph databases are structured or what's the, what's the fundamental or the core of, uh, of a graph database or a graph theory. So out here, what you're seeing are two circles joined by a line, by an arrow. Uh, the two circles as you, uh, that you saw are basically nodes or vertices in a graph. These commonly represent your objects, your entities, or merely things. So in, if you recall the seven bridges of Konigsberg problem uh, that we talked earlier, nodes were used to represent your land masses. Um, another example that everyone can relate to is the concept of social graph. So you have people, like multiple of people, they interact with each other and form relationships of varying strengths. Okay, so nodes become useful because they can hold a proper, uh, they can hold data in the form of properties. They have labels to define an optional schema. For example, in a query, if you say that which actors play in this movie, uh, how many movies did this director direct, which users rated movies with more than four out of five rating. So all the nouns in this movie are nothing but your nodes, right? Now what connects these nodes is called relationships, or we also call them as edges. Uh, relationships are useful because they also hold the data in the form of properties. They have types to define an optional schema and they can connect the nodes explicitly. And of course, they allow for a direction. If it's this side, uh, like arrow pointing to the one side of the node, that means it's pointing to that. So it's a, it's a directed graph. In a query, uh, in, your, in the previous example, all your relationships are typically your verbs. So actors, play. So the play is your verb and that's going to be your relationship as well. So we could use a relationship to represent a personal or professional connection, like person knows person, person married to another person, to state a fact, like person lives in look in certain location, person owns a car, person rated a movie, or even to represent a hierarchy, like parent is parent of child or software depends on library, so and so forth. Let's take another example to make it more clear uh, for all of us. In this case, it's a MacBook. It could be a product, um, another any other car or location, something that, that's physical. So we're just taking MacBook over here so that we can identify these nodes with one or more labels. Now we know nodes represent things and then nodes can be identified by one or more labels. So we said that MacBook is a product and we gave a label. Is another uh, assign a label to Basically, we assign a label to essentially group a node, and this allows us to retrieve that later. There can be one or more labels. So we assign another label over here, and we say it's MacBook is the product, and it's fragile. No, so in this example, we have used the product, but marked as fragile. But we have also assigned properties to the nodes in key value pairs. So in this case, we have name property. So it's a MacBook Pro. And then we have the price, which is 2699 USD, right? Now we use these relationships to connect these nodes together. We know this for a fact. So we have created another node, a customer node out here. Now, so these, so there's a line between the two circles. We call this a relationship and we are connecting these two nodes together. There's a single relationship over here. There's a key value pair of name and email in the customer node, right? And we know that there's a, there's a type as well and we say that this customer has rated that product. So rated is your relationship type. Now we also, if, if you also notice that we, there's a direction over here, although you can ignore this direction query in either direction of the query time, we can also assign properties to the relationships uh, like this. So we have stars as another property that's been added, key value pair that's been added and created as another key value pair. So in the context, we're saying that uh, this customer in the name of Sid has rated a MacBook Pro with three stars. Maybe he's not too happy with the quality of the product over here, right? So quick recap. So nodes are your vertices. These are your building blocks of graph. They're used to represent objects or entities of interest in a given domain. They can be labeled to form groups of similar entities. They can have one or more labels and can additionally have properties. 
relationships are also called edges. They are used to connect nodes. They have uh, they provide structure to the graph. They have a type and a direction. They can additionally have properties, and they uh, they can be multiple relationships between nodes. Properties, these add colors to the graph, so they enrich the nodes and relationships with additional information. They represent it as key value pairs. Now, uh, now that we have shown the elements of graph, uh, you must be wondering how does it map back to relational databases? So your rows become your nodes, your joins becomes your relationships, your table names becomes your labels, and your columns becomes your properties. That's how the mapping looks like. Uh, if you're really wondering of relational versus graphs or how, how it's get, getting mapped. Okay, uh, quickly moving on to the Cypher. So Cypher is a pattern matching query language purposefully built for graphs. Now, uh, Cypher, think of, think of Cypher as another graph query language. So you have heard of SQL. Uh, structured query language, which is used to run on, uh, which, which is which runs on your relational databases. Now there is Cipher, which runs on your graph databases, specifically on Neo4j. Uh, there's something called as GQL, which is more like an IOS standard for graph query language, just like SQL has become more like an IOS standard for your relational databases. Uh, GQL, in some time, is going to uh, become like a like a uh, de facto language for your graph databases. All the graph databases across in the industry. Um, and Cypher is contributing a lot to GQL this day, uh, this time right now. So it's declarative, it's expressive, it uses like simple uh, SKI art. Let's see how. So we'll take the previous example and we're just gonna convert those two nodes into rounded brackets, like right, to kind of draw this kind of a circle. So your customer and your product becomes like two round brackets. And then we use a colon to define information that we're interested in. Uh, the pattern of the nodes. In this case, we're defining the labels over here. So we have customer on the left and the product on the right. So we have colon customer, colon product. Now, in order to draw the relationships, we use dashes. So we specify that with two dashes over here, uh, one after product and one before, sorry, one after customer and one before product. And then we use a greater than or less than arrow to define the direction of the relationship. So in this case, it's saying that relationship is going from customer to the product. So we add in um, a um, uh, an arrow accordingly. Then we use square brackets to draw a box around the relationships. And the way we added for nodes, uh, we similarly use colons to specify information about the relationship. In this case, we, uh, case we say the relationship type with a colon and say rated, colon rated. And then with all of these patterns, uh, what we what we can do is we can assign a variable to each one of these elements, nodes and relationships so that we can process them, we can pull information from them in the future. So we say C colon customer, R colon rated, P colon product. So C, R and P are basically your variables or objects over here. Okay, now the way uh, that we read from a database using Cypher is what's called as the match clause. So in this clause, we have uh, we, like we we use a match clause at the at the start, and then we define a pattern. So we are defining the pattern, or um, what's sent to the database is find me a node with a label of customer, and give that an alias or a variable C, and then we want an outgoing relationship to a product, right? And then once we have that pattern, the pattern has been found in the database. We use the return clause to return that information about these nodes. So we want the customer name here, uh, customer name there, uh, to return uh, to us. Or uh, we also want that we want the product names to be returned, and we also want the star rating to be returned as uh, returned to us. In this case, we are calling it the product, and then we are talking about the stars property from the rated relationship type. Right. right. Okay. Moving on next. Um, this is the quick cipher sheet, like a quick reference guide for cipher. So if any bit of time you get stuck, you want to know more about queries. So right now, we I just give a very short, like a 50,000 fit view of how cipher looks like. That's just one clause, match clause, there are multiple clause if you want to insert data into the database, if you want to read from the database, um, there are multiple of those queries out there. So you can go to this cheat sheet um, called dev.neo4j.com slash ref card, and this will give you uh, your Cypher reference card. So you can switch to the Cypher version, switch it to the current one, and then you can start um, going to the documentation from there. 
Okay, quick recap. Um, that's how it looks like. So nodes, square brackets, relationships, dashes, and arrows, and round uh, on the uh, sorry, nodes are the round brackets, relationships are the dashes, arrows, and square brackets. Uh, then you add colons the way you add for both nodes and relationships. Then you can add an inline property, a variable uh, to both of them. Okay, so we talked about what are graphs, uh, how the industry looks like, why specifically graphs, um, about Neo4j, uh, about Cypher. Now, why are graphs in, like amazing? So, and we're going to touch base on some of the real world examples of impact, like how graphs have been used in real case scenarios. So, graph technology is talent for handling semi structured and unstructured changing data. data makes it ideal for handling the complexities and challenges of enterprise applications. So we believe that this is the reason why graphs have been the fastest growing database category by far for the past 10 years. The explosion in data complexity is driving adoption of graph databases, the only system purpose built to store and navigate relationships in connective data. Now the re uh, limitations of traditional relation databases became uh, become apparent when it comes to exploring multiple levels of connections in data. As the number of connections increases, graph continues to provide millisecond performance while relation databases struggle and collapse under the weight of data complexity. And data challenges today are increasingly uh, complex with many layers of connections. For example, most supply chains today have dozens and dozens of levels. Managing a supply chain in real time is unfeasible with an app backed by a relational database. Or consider fraud rings where you need to explore multiple levels of connections to expose individuals with certain shared characteristics. Uh, modern fraud detection is simply impossible with legacy relational systems. And then more. If you have heard of Panama Papers, this is a very classic example. Uh, ICIJ, uh, investigative consortium of, sorry, international consortium of investigative journalists. I always mess this up. Um, ICIJ uh, was trying to blow, like a, like a whistle blow to the, to the entire financial and legal records. And they, they used graphs out there, like Neo4j specifically, to build out the entire um, structure of various entities, various companies, people who are managing these companies, uh, and put them into Panama Papers in 2016. And then they later on came up with uh, uh, Pandora paper, Paradise Papers in 2017. Then they came up with Pandora Papers in 2021 to talk about all the offshore heavens and hidden riches of the world leaders and everything. During COVID as well, there was this interesting project called COVID Graph Project, uh, which used graphs to map from one to another, travel, age, Province, uh, everything, and created a nice COVID graph as a non not for profit project. So, not all problems are graph problems. So, how do you know that this is a graph problem and you need to solve it with a graph? So, there are a couple of scenarios or use cases where you can think of graphs to be of, of good use. Uh, one of them is uh, does your problem involve understanding relationship with entities? Uh, use cases like your recommendations, your fraud detection, your entity resolution, the data lineage, your social networks, uh, these come into this category. The next scenario is when you have a lot of self-references, you have hierarchies. Um, you have a manager, there's managers, manager, there's managers, manager, and then there's manager, manager. All of them are actually employees, right? When you have, when you want to explore relationships of like unknown depth, you are not sure how far you need to go into the database. Um, you have routing problem, you have bills of material, you have network management, supply chain visibility. Those are the scenarios where graph databases are really, really powerful. Um, another scenario is, does your problem involve discovering lots of different routes or paths? So you, just the way I said, the first example of the metro, that's one of the examples of graph, but on a bigger scale. Okay, so that's on, graphs and how graphs and why graphs are useful. Uh, talking a bit on the Neo4j graph data science. So Neo4j is not just a graph database. It's an integrated platform that can process real-time transactions and deliver real-time analytics to applications. Um, your APIs, your BI tools, uh, everything. 
So anal uh, analysts and data scientists can perform uh, ad hoc investigations and preventive uh, predictive analytics directly within the platform using a Neo4j uh, browser and graph data science uh, module. So we created an entire ecosystem around it from querying to analytics to your uh, machine learning part. And there's a huge interest in graph, which is fueled by AI and ML uh, on what's important, what's unusual, and what's next to find out and explore the hidden patterns and features in your data so that you can make better predictions uh, with the data that you already have. You can uh, start using, start putting a machine learning pipeline into uh, graphs. Graph data science, uh, these are these are some of the examples. Like you start with knowledge graphs, then you mature it to graph algorithms, and then move on to the graph natal uh, ML. When you want to uh, find out in your graph that you don't like features in your graph that you don't even know are important yet. There are plenty of those graph algorithms out there, uh, almost 60 plus, 65 plus, uh, that algorithms that we have created uh, that you can use as a set of instructions that visit the nodes of graph to analyze the relationships in connected uh, data. Um, how do you use Neo4j? How do you get started with Neo4j? Uh, the three options, you can use it as a service. We have something called as Neo4j Aura, which is self uh, which is uh, database as a service hosted on cloud. You can always go for a cloud managed service on Google Cloud, AWS, or Azure, or you can go with a self-hosted version of it uh, for private, hybrid, or lift and shift cloud. Um, as I said, like we have a very strong integrations with Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. So at any point of time you want to get onto these, you can do it. Um, I think uh, I would be running a little short on the time. So I'm just gonna skip the demo and just show you how it works. So it's pretty easy if you want to use the Aura DB, which is our database as a service, and that's the best way to go and get started with. Just go to neo4j.com slash Aura. And there you just have to choose the Aura DB instance, click on new instance. There's, there's plenty of those data sets all, uh, already available. Just click on one of those data sets and create. It takes a little while to create. Make sure you keep the password safe because you might be needing it later on and then just fire it up. This is how it works. So you go to neofoja.com slash Aura, you can get started. You land up on this kind of a page. You click on new instance. Uh, it will ask you for uh, whether you want to create an empty instance or with an existing data set. You select a data set and the data set just gets loaded automatically if you're selecting an existing one. Uh, if you want, you can rename it. Uh, that's up to you. So the free instance is lifetime free. There are 200,000 nodes and 400,000 relationships that comes along with the one free instance. Um, yeah, and then you just connect the password file that you say, just add in the password, and then you're good to start with. Um, there's browser rendered guides as well to walk you through how to go, go about working with Neo4j. Okay, uh, Maggie, do we have time by any chance? I think I... maybe it's a good time for us to take some questions. Uh, I've already started seeing questions coming in. Do you think? Okay. Um, I, you I'll just cover up a few things, uh, just last sure. couple of slides before we take up the Q&A. Um, okay. So, okay, that's that's about how to get started. But if you want to continue a graph journey, you want to have more learning, that's the place for you. That's called Graph Academy. We have these free self-paced online courses curated for you with various learning paths. Um, make sure you go in over there, uh, take up these two certifications once you are done to test your knowledge, Craft Data Science Certification and Neo4j Certified Professional. Uh, I shared the QR code in the link over here. It's graphacademy.neo4j.com.